the Hockey Hall of Fame, Canada's shrine to our game. Home to so many legends who have left their mark on the ice, from Gordie Howe to Haley Wickenheiser to the great one himself. And looming large over all of them, Ken Dryden. The iconic goalie was an absolute colossus for the Montreal Canadiens in the 1970s. Winning a remarkable six Stanley Cups in just nine playoffs. Ken Dryden turned the old forum into a fortress. It, it's a privilege for me to talk to you anywhere, but especially here, the Hockey Hall of Fame, and especially in this room. I, I, I walked in here this morning and I find it breathtaking, this replica of the Montreal Canadiens dressing room. What's this like for you? Yeah, it, it's, it's very much the same. I mean, it, it is breathtaking and it is an exact replica. This is what it looked like and, and really felt like. And it's a much more intimate space than the dressing rooms now. And, and, and you see the numbers of the great players. And, and one of the things that I always enjoyed the most is just looking up at the plaques because there is a plaque for every Montreal Canadiens team and a list of every one of the players who played in that year. And then you see M. Richard, you see Beliveau, and you see Plante. And I, I appear in 1970-71, you know, and one of the things that, that they did is when I left for a year, mm -hmm. they dropped me. <laughs> <laughs> they dropped me to the bottom. The, the year I came back, they put me back near the bottom of the right column again. Well, that'll teach you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are, surrounded by all of this nostalgia. I want to show you this. This is a really nice. slightly embarrassing picture, but this was uh, in the September wow. of 1974. And uh, you were playing an exhibition game in Moncton, New Brunswick. And wow. uh, it's the, I, I was presenting you a gift on behalf of the town of Sackville. <laughs> and it's the only time in my life that I've ever been speechless. So I'm sure you remember that, that moment the way I remember well. it. <laughs> Actually, it, it, it really is terrific. I can't believe the, the difference in size oh, yeah. of the well, two of us. You know, the difference in size is almost <laughs> the same now, but it's even, it's even captioned the long and the short. Anyway, you've touched a lot of people's lives nice. in ways that you can't even imagine. Uh, hockey players and, like me, non-hockey players in, in lots of different ways. And, and, and a key part of that, of course, is what happened 50 years ago this month, right? The, the Summit Series. And I, I read in your book, and I found this interesting, that you avoided watching the footage of that series for a long, long time. Finally, you had to as you prepared for a documentary, but uh, I want to show you a quick montage of some of the video, if that's okay, and, uh, and get your reaction to it. As you watch this, this video, you lived it, but as you watch it, just, just tell me what goes through your mind. Well, actually, I'm nervous. <laughs> Even <laughs> so, now? Yeah, just in, just in watching this, and, and, and I, I pretty much know what's going to happen, I think, and yes, it did. <laughs> Montages are not very friendly to goalies. <laughs> we understand he is to be the starting goalie tonight, so indeed there will be an extreme amount of pressure on Dryden. You played and lost in game one, as you may remember. <laughs> <laughs> then you didn't play again until game four in Vancouver, right. and the team lost again. Right. And the team got booed off the ice. Right. And famously, Phil Esposito spoke to not only the people in the rink, but also to Canada in a very impassioned yeah. speech. Yeah. All of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got, uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own buildings. I'm really disappointed. I am completely disappointed. I cannot believe it. Some of our guys are really, really down in the dumps. We know, we're trying, what the hell, I mean, we're, we're doing the best we can, and uh, they got a good team, and let's face facts, but uh, it doesn't mean that we're not uh, giving it our 150%, because we certainly are. You wouldn't have heard that speech, right? You were no, in the dressing room. No, and I, I don't know when any of us would have heard it. I, I think it was certainly well after the series was over, but the message clearly to 22 million people is that I care, we care. We're losing, but we care. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, 
from that moment on. We, we had started as us and us. It had become a bit of an us and them by the end of Vancouver, and then it was us and us until the end. I think it's my most vivid memory of that entire series was the Canadian fans in Moscow. Not a lot of Canadians had traveled to Europe in, in 1972. Very few beyond, behind the Iron Curtain, very few to Moscow. It was sort of understood as this alien world and frightening world. And here are 3,000 Canadians that were there and they're singing their lungs out. I mean, it was, it was so moving, you know, that. And it mattered. And it mattered. I mean, it was just, the whole thing was so emotional. So they go into the final game all tied up. Let's fast forward to game eight. At that point, the series, which by the way, Canada was supposed to win eight straight games, but it came down to game eight. The two teams were tied. You were the goalie. As a kid, you know, you were this old guy. But now I look at it now, you were just 25 years old. Mm. And the weight of a nation is on your shoulders and, and you felt it. I did. The question for me was that I had never quite felt this way before. And, and just as the other players had. I mean, we had all been in these big games before. You literally had been in game seven of the Stanley Cup final before. And yet you still were feeling that something was different here. That's right. And because it felt different, then how was I going to end up reacting out of it? Would, would the same pattern follow? Would those jellied legs that had always disappeared before, would they disappear this time or would they stay with me? And that was a bit on my mind. But then, you know, of course, the game does begin and all of that's gone. And so you're into it and now you've got to make something of it. Spoiler alert, you guys won game eight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, one of the really intriguing things I read in your book was I, I knew that you and the Montreal Canadiens went on to win five Stanley Cups after September of 1972. But I think you wrote that had you not won that game, had Team Canada not won that game, you're not sure that you would have gone on to win those Stanley Cups. Why? If, if we had lost the series, I would have been um, um, a significant part of that loss and I would have felt that humiliation. And, and it's easy for anybody to say we're all professionals and, uh, uh, and as professionals we get over stuff like that and we're on to the next game. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I mean I, I think that that's not something that fades out of mind easily. You described the series I think even game one as being transformational for hockey and mm -hmm. I think that anyone under the age of 40 or 50 probably can't fully understand that. It's like trying to explain to somebody how the Beatles transform music. If you yeah, weren't around yeah. during the, the British invasion, it, it's hard to remember what music was like before. Right. In what way did that yeah. 72 series change hockey? Yeah, I mean, I think it is the, the most significant moment in international hockey history, not just Canadian hockey history. And I think that it's, it's because up until that moment, hockey really was uh, a game that was defined by Canada in every way. We were the originators, we were the developers, we were the best at it, we were undeniably the best at it. And because we were all of those things, the understanding that we had, but also that others had, is that there was really one way to play. But that was the state of things in, in 1972. And that everybody knew that the Soviets played differently. And, and that's interesting, but it isn't important unless you play differently and really well. That's what they demonstrated in 1972. I mean, and, and once there is another way you know, that you can see that, that can be played successfully, and that just totally opens the mind. And then after that, things just took off. Players work out regularly at home, too. There's no fat on Vyacheslav Anisin as he does his daily exercise routine. And so off-ice training that was sort of, okay, you kind of do it a little bit, but really, let's do everything on ice. No, let's do more of it and, and more of it and more of it. 
and special coaches and and uh, and 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 other fitness and nutrition things mm -hmm. and 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 why only seven eight nine months a year why not 11 months a year i mean all of those things came out of the 1972 series and hockey's better for it it is i mean it's like you just you just look at what you see on the ice i mean go into a local arena mm -hmm. you know, watch nine-year-olds play 12-year-olds play i mean we have a couple of grandkids who play and we see their games it's unbelievable you know what they are able to do it's it's like anything else in our lives things are impossible until somebody shows they're possible and then once they become possible they become the norm and then you develop then there's the new impossible that becomes the possible and the new norm and things just change it's really exciting to finally get a chance to sit down and talk with you, but you've also made me excited about hockey. Like, you sound very optimistic about hockey, and I think uh, that's infectious. So thank yeah. you very much. Oh, thanks, Ian. Thank you.